Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. How does it make you feel when you think about the Lord looks at you and says, you're holy and blameless in my sight. You're clean. I mean, I got you in a radiant white garment of, I mean, you are completely washed. Anyone here think this is cool? Oh, yeah. We're like, dig that, man. The Lord looks at me cleaned. But men, you're supposed to present your wives the same way that Christ presents the church. Some guys don't let me teach this part. They're like, could you move to something else? I'm like, but this is in the book. This is Paul's talking about, okay, look, these are the subtleties of marriage that make marriage sweet. When the guys do this for their wives, how do the wives feel? I mean, it's how do we feel when the Lord does it for us? We're like, that's awesome. So why, guys, don't you do it for your wife and make her feel awesome? By the way, it's not even a suggestion. It's a command. We're told to do this. And the very first commandment in the scripture, I find it very interesting because there's a lot of words about doing marriage in a, I mean, spectacular way. Doing it right. And the very first command in the scripture is to mankind, when God creates Adam, and Eve, and he puts them in the garden, he says, and, and he puts, the, God created them in his own image, male and female. This is Genesis 1, verse 27. And God blessed them, verse 28. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The very first command to mankind from God, he creates man and woman. He makes them, you read the next chapter, he creates them, he, he puts them in the garden There's no thorns, there's no thistles. I love this garden. I wish my garden was like this. Perfect garden, and and he says, here's your perfect bride. It says they were both naked, and they were not what? Ashamed. Sin hadn't crept in yet. You talk about a, does anyone think this would be ideal? In a perfect garden, made by God, no thorns, no thistles, with the perfect woman, you know, or gals, with the perfect guy, from God for you, put in a garden, and your first command, you're naked, you're not ashamed, because there's not sin hasn't crept into the world yet. So you're just in the garden, and God says, be fruitful and multiply. And you know, I I have to laugh, because I think about this story, and I think, I hear these people tell me, God's really uptight about sex. (laughs) You haven't read the Bible, have you? Not even the first chapter. I can tell you didn't get far. Because if you read the good book, the good book, the very first thing he tells them is, be fruitful. I don't know how you do that when you're naked in a garden with the perfect person. I'm pretty sure it means you're supposed to have sex. And God tells them to do this, right? I mean, God is not uptight about sex. God just wants you to have sex in the right context. Being married in his sight, doing it right. And Paul, Paul recognized, you know, if you're married, you need to understand some of the laying, I mean, just what we call this ground rules or something. Your body's not your own. Just like he just finished telling the whole church, your body belongs to the Lord. But when you're married, Jesus said, what God has joined together, let no man what? Remember Matthew 19? What God joins together, no man separate. Mark 10 also tells the same account. The Lord puts two and makes them one. Now those two are one in God's sight, and they have to serve him as one. And no longer is your concern only just individual, just when you're not married, you can say, here I am, Lord, just, it's just me. My whole body's yours. But now when you're married, it's your whole body is joined to your spouse. It's you two together as one. Here we are. Honey, 
I feel the Lord is telling not me to go to Hawaii because he wouldn't send me if I'm married to her without her. Honey, I think the Lord's telling us we're going to Hawaii. It's a really interesting thing I notice when you talk to people who've been married a while, they don't talk in singular. They don't go, I, me. Have you noticed this? It's like, and we did this, and we did that, and us, and we, and, you know. Because the two become one. And it's just something that, it's designed by God to be that way. But when you're one with someone here, you need to take care of that person. As they're going to take care of you, you're going to take care. Now, that's a beautiful thing. It's a great mystery, it says, but it represents this greater thing. It's a picture of Christ and the church to the world. You do your marriage well, and your neighbors will say, wow, what, what is the deal? They say, well, I'm just trying to copy what Jesus would do. I'm trying to live out my marriage in a holy way unto God. Do you get to have sex? In this holy way? Paul says, you better make sure you take care of each other. I'm pretty sure he's talking about that. And, and if you should happen to decide to not be together in an intimate way, then, well, he actually says, stop depriving one another. You know, I wonder if somewhere in the letter they wrote to him, they were going, well, we decided to deprive one another so we can be more holy. Paul said, concerning the things on which you wrote, stop <laughs> depriving one another. Bad idea. Because, or, believe me, Christians can come up with corny ideas. I'm pretty sure someone in the group there went, hey, maybe we should just like, you know, we're married and everything, but we, we should just like devote ourselves to God and forget about our spouses. We'll call it Holy Week or something. Holy devotion. Paul says, doesn't fly. You know why it doesn't fly? Because Satan will creep in and try to tempt and he says, because of lack of self-control, it's a trap. He says, don't fall for it. Only thing you can separate for is for an agreed agreement has to happen, first of all. Not this, some, I've heard people use this very text to go, well, I decided we need to have a time out. You know, from those physical affections. Where did you come up with that? Oh, I read it in Corinthians. You didn't read it correctly. It says that you are not, it says stop depriving one another except by agreement for a period of time and make sure it's only for the purpose of what? Devoting yourselves to prayer. And when you're done with your prayer time, guess what you get to do? Go get back together with your spouse. Have some intimate time. So you don't leave the door open for Satan to come in and tempt you. You know, there's one thing I, I don't know. Uh, I hear some guys bragging in the world about, oh, yeah, I'm the sexual Don Juan. You know, I, I have encounters every other day or every, you know, three times a week. And I'm just thinking, poor guy. It's a sad thing. You, you're doing it all wrong. And they don't understand that if you would just walk upright in the Lord, the Lord will take care of you. And he'll take care of you so you're not tempted. It's a great thing to have your spouse and not deprive yourself from one another so that it, it's a safeguard. If you can believe this, it's an actual safeguard that when you're married, you have sex together. And oh boy, I'll get in trouble for this because it's going to go on the radio and the internet. And That pastor actually said married couples are supposed to have sex. Yes, you are. And you're supposed to not deprive one another of each other. Where did you come up with the idea that you're supposed to deprive your spouse of your affections? Only Satan would whisper something that diabolical. Because if he can get people to do that, the next thing he's going to do is send in a temptation to the spouse that's being deprived. He does it all the time. Think about, you know, all the storylines you've seen in the, in the television shows where the that, you know, one spouse is like, I'm mad at you. When I'm not going to be affectionate with you today. And the guy goes, oh, man, i got to get out of here. And he digs out and he goes to work or whatever. And the, the secretary goes, oh, 
you're not being taken care of at home. I'm here. You know, it, it's like, s could this be Satan? What a setup. I mean, this is like, you got to be kidding me. But it's because somebody got this idea, I'll deprive my spouse. It's a punishment. I said, I'm mad at them. I'll show them. Listen, don't fall for that. That's, a sat that's Satan whispering in your ear. That's a revelation from the pit. Your body is not your own. Just like Paul said, your body belongs to the Lord. Now you're married. You're both your bodies belong to the Lord, but that doesn't mean you deprive each other. You're married. Take care of each other, he says. Now, how would he know this stuff if he was never married? You think? I mean, I'm just suggesting possibility. Don't say the pastor said for sure. Okay? I don't get heaven and I'm going to get knocked out. But I think it's a high probability this guy was married and understood. Now he goes on and he says, Yet I wish that all men were even as, my, as I myself am. However, he says, each man has his own gift from, from God. One in this manner, another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. So what is, what is he at this point? Single. But he says, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn in, in, in his lust or, or with passion. You guys have heard that right before. It was better to marry than to burn in lust. When I read that verse, I went, Amen. Sign me up. Get married. I mean, at least the guy understands. Some of us have drive. You know, I'm being raised Italian, and we're always taught, you know, it's in our blood. Just part of the thing, you know. But Paul didn't say, well, you just die to that and act like it doesn't exist. He said, no. If you, it, he said, not everybody's going to be able to hear this. But to the married person... He says, I give instructions. Not I, but the Lord. Now listen to this. He says, he says, he says that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not divorce his wife. In other words, he's, he's doing what Jesus said. Let what God joined together, let no man what? Separate. He says, Do you, don't, you don't use this as an excuse. He says, but to the rest I say, not, not, not the Lord. This is just like me telling you that if a brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, then he must not divorce her. And if a woman has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, then she, sh she should not send him away. For he says, the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children are unclean. But now, because one of the believing ones is a spiritual coming, he says they are holy. Yet, he says, if the unbelieving one... Now, why do you see, think he says verse 15? Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. I submit to you, Paul might have had his wife say, I don't believe what you believe now that you had this radical conversion. I'm out of here. And Paul probably had to explain that to the church at Corinth because they saw that he was single. And, then, and they're probably wondering, he's going, look, if the unbelieving one doesn't want to stay with the believing one, then you have to let him go. But what if they're willing to stay? Should you say, well, I'm a believer, you're not a believer now? We need to divorce? What was his, what was his answer? You got to stay. You got kids. And he's got another reason that he explains a little bit later in the chapter. He says, how do you not know? Well, look, look at this. Let me just read it to you. He says, for how do you know, verse 16, whether you will save your husband or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? You know, why do you want to be divorced from them? You, oh, well, we weren't Christians when we got married, and I got saved, and they didn't. Well, how do you know that God's not going to use you to help them be led to the Lord? 
See, Paul says, you don't know that. So you can't just use this, so, well, I became a Christian, and they didn't, so I'm cutting it off. He's nope. If they're willing to stay with you, what's the answer? Stay. Be a light. In a relationship that, that is, represents the greatest mystery there is, the mystery of Christ and his church, you really want to show Christ, then you stay and love them with the love of God. And there's a good chance, Paul says, how do you know? How do you know that you're not the one that's going to lead them to the Lord? I mean, really, we tend to come to know about the Lord from people that are close to us. If you, if you, if you go through all different church folks and, and talk to them and say, you know, did anyone in your life, your, was, was, who, 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 who really showed you things about God? And you start to find out, oh, it was a family member or a spouse or my grandmother or, you know, someone they're close to. They always had this faith. And, and I used to mock it when I was younger. But then as I got older, I thought, well, you know, no, no, she always believed. She always prayed. If my grandmother used to get out of bed. It didn't matter how cold it was. House would be freezing, and, and I'd be a little boy walking by her door, and she would be on her knees next to her bed praying in the morning. And I thought, if God is not real, she's cuckoo. Because it's freezing. The floor is hard and cold. And yet she gets out of bed and she prays to God every day. Here I am. She started her day presenting herself to God. Use me how you want to use me. You know what that does for a young child? It teaches them God is real. And we learn. And how do you not know? Why not stay with your spouse? Maybe you'll be the one to show them God's real. And maybe that will be the thing that draws them to the Lord. Do you think your spouse is watching your walk? I mean, face it. Even if you're both believers, they're still watching. And you want to walk well in the Lord for your spouse's sake. If you can receive this, this is really the, the best thing I can tell you. If you want to have a great marriage, then do your walk well. Live like Christ in your relationship and live your faith truly to the Lord and watch how good it makes your marriage. Because it's the best thing you can do. Here I am, Lord. What do you want to do with me? He's like, I want to shut up that stupid selfishness in you. You're annoying your wife. I'm going to work on that today. Or whatever area he's got a... You see, with us guys, we've got a few rough edges. He's chiseling. You know, iron sharpens iron. He's like, I've got to work some edges off this guy. So she can handle him. But we need her help. God made it that way. And guys, don't get prideful and say, I don't need her. That's the stupidest idea ever. You know how much marriage counseling I get to, it's going to sound funny, I get to solve whew, these heavy problems. When they come to see me, <laughs> you're like, so what's going on? And basically, he's a messed up mess that needs help. And she's sitting there wanting to help him, but he's saying, what? Don't need it. And I'm like, just a suggestion. She's called a help mate. From God, helpmate. What, what, why do you think she's called a helpmate? I, I play stupid with the guys. You know, helpmate, what's that mean? She needs help? No. What's it mean? He needs help. Some, to some guys, this is a big revelation. They're like, whoa, I didn't realize that. I never, and you know, honestly, <laughs> When, when it finally sinks in and they go, yeah, you're right. Now, now most guys, show of hands, how many of you guys know you need help? If you, if you look around, you'll notice most of the hands that went up are married ones already. <laughs> we figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> but Paul says if you can receive it, and next week we're going to continue with this because he's going to talk about what about if you're single? What about if you're single now? He, he's addressed the married crowd. 
Next week, he's going to turn his attention to the single ones, to the ones that have not ever been married or have never known, a, to the virgin. What about them? How do they serve the Lord? And he gives some advice and some words, strong words from the Lord. So if, you, if you're in that state, I want you to come back next week because you'll find out it's, it's going to be some really encouraging words. And some of you married ones, I want you to pay attention to those words because so, you're going to have to use them, trust me, when, you're, when your own kids ask you for advice. You might want to know the end of chapter 7 of Corinthians to give them answers. Because there's some really good, good wisdom. Just like there's good wisdom for us married folk, how we should do our relationship, there's some really good wisdom for the single ones, how they do it. And it's all because Paul was just writing back to the church to answer their questions. You know, concerning the stuff you guys asked me about, let me tell you. And that's what he's doing right now in this chapter. So next week, we'll pick up the rest of the chapter. If you get a chance, would you read ahead for me? And, and read even into the beginning of chapter 8 because it kind of flows. You know, there's a, there's a flow to what he's doing right here. And I, I think when you catch it, it, it gives you more insight into what's going on. So would you join me? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your scriptures, Lord. And for the poor single ones that had to listen today, well, next week they'll get theirs. But for us that are married, help us to live these words out, Lord, in a way that really gives glory to you and to your son. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving your church so much, loving us as your bride. For those that don't know about your love, your, your great, great love, the, an invitation to be part of your bride, I just pray their ears would be open that you would let the, their spirit hear that you love them and you want them to be included. We pray for those friends of ours and those acquaintances that don't know your love yet, that you would let us be a light to them. Through our marriages, through the, the ones that are single, how they serve you in their singleness, Lord, that they would serve you with a whole heart, that we would, that we would really shine for you in these days and in this place that you have placed us. I ask that now in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's sing a closing song and let you go in the joy of the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.